I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, give a talk in FSCD, which is one of my uh, favorite conferences, and also to thank them for giving me the opportunity to um, talk about the latest developments in the K-Framework, and also to um, present our vision, how things should, uh, should go from here. Uh, my talk is going to be about uh, formal methods and uh, programming language semantics in the context of the blockchain, but um, um, I'm going to first introduce very briefly the challenges uh, from the blockchain and what motivated us to uh, go into, into this area. So one of the main applications of the blockchain, as many of you know, is uh, cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are this uh, digital money that, uh, that we hear um, about, uh, like uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and uh, many others. And uh, some people think that this could be the future of money, others think that not. I'm not here to debate that uh, problem. I'm going to go into technical issues um, of a different nature, of, uh, of, a, of a programming language and formal methods uh, nature. But um, first, just to put things in context, um, uh, so cryptocurrencies um, have uh, an increased uh, use uh, these days and, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, they have more and more um, capital uh, in, 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 in invested. Uh, so if you only look at, there are, there are hundreds of them, and if you only look at the top five cryptocurrencies, uh, they actually hold more than $200 billion. So um, it's something that we have to take uh, seriously, at least. I'm not here to teach you how the blockchain works, uh, because uh, that's not really my area. Um, I would like to emphasize, though, what are the big challenges uh, for us as formal methods and programming language uh, uh, researchers in the blockchain space. <clears throat> so at a very, very high level, the blockchain works as follows. So suppose that you want to perform a transaction, and for the purpose of this talk, let's assume that the transaction can be any program that you can execute. So it's a program that you can see and run and execute. Uh, in particular, if you move value V from account A to account B, that's a particular program. But uh, you can think that you can have any, any program, literally, that uh, runs on a shared state. Right? So it's a state that is shared among many different uh, uh, um, actors, and, uh, and uh, the programs are public. You can see the code, and all these programs modify that uh, shared state. Then. Um, once you initiate a transaction, the transaction is uh, sent to um, a node, a so-called node, and then the nodes, um, uh, that node broadcasts the transaction, and the transaction then needs to be validated by the other nodes. That means that they re-execute the code in the transaction in order to agree using algorithms for achieving consensus under the hood, uh, and those are not our concern in this talk. But those different um, nodes, they, the point is that those re-execute uh, the transaction in order to, to determine uh, whether, um, uh, how they should modify the state. And um, they do that using virtual machines. And once the transaction is validated, then um, each of the nodes deploys the transaction um, locally. And this way, they modify the history or the distributed ledger or uh, the blockchain uh, by appending a new block of transactions um, at the end of the existing uh, block of transactions. And this way, each node has uh, a, 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 new, a, a view of the new world, a new state of the, of the world. And uh, because of the consensus algorithms, all the nodes together have the same shared view. And uh, what is appealing here is that it is all decentralized. There is no uh, node in control saying uh, what uh, the transaction is and how the state should, should, uh, should, should change. <clears throat> now, the interesting part comes um, from the fact that some of these transactions can actually put new code on the blockchain, right? So you can have a new code called a smart contract that you can uh, um, uh, pass to another, uh, in, in, into one of the accounts, and then future transactions can evoke your code. So this is where all the problems come. 
you can put new code on the blockchain. That code is uh, visible and everybody can initiate a transaction using your code. And uh, we end up with an environment where <laughs> all the code is public. And this is where the unprecedented challenges uh, come from, right? You end up with code which is um, uh, public, which um, anybody can invoke, and which can irreversibly change the state. In particular, it can steal your money. Uh, if, uh, if that's what the program does, uh, to move money from your account somewhere else, then everybody will agree that <laughs> the money was moved from your account somewhere else, and, uh, and, and the money is stolen. And because of that, uh, we have, uh, there is a huge incentive for hackers to actually attack uh, bugs or weaknesses uh, or flaws in, uh, in, um, in uh, smart contracts. More like any time before. Uh, to give you an idea of uh, how a smart contract looks like, I have a little uh, a snippet of code here, part of, um, of a larger contract, a so-called ERC20 uh, contract, which is a protocol for moving value around uh, on the, you know, between different accounts. And, um, and um, just you know, for you to understand of the, the, the scale of, of, of these uh, contracts, there are, there are about 40,000 uh, uh, similar contracts running on the Ethereum uh, blockchain. And all of them have pretty similar code. Also, there are slight differences here and there. Uh, so this, this, this snippet here only shows a function called transfer which uh, um, uh, is invoked by somebody, that would be the caller into the transaction, and then uh, there is an address where you want to transfer the money to from your account and a value. And then um, the code goes uh, like um, pretty much like as you would expect. You first uh, check if, uh, if the value is zero, you return false, then you, um, um, then you check if you have sufficient funds, and then you check if the, the, the account you want to transfer the money to um, runs into an overflow if you do that. Remember that all the state is shared, so you can see exactly what uh, value is in the account you want to transfer the money to. So you check if you have um, a, an overflow or not. And then if you have sufficient funds and there is no overflow, you actually do the transaction. Right? So it looks very natural, um, uh, very little code. But in fact, this code has problems. Even though it is very simple, it already has problems. Um, and uh, with the technology that I'm going to talk about, we actually can detect this, uh, these problems. For example, um, the ERC20 protocol doesn't state that you have to return false if the value is zero. In some cases, that can actually mean um, 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 a lot and, 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 and some other contract may fail if you, if you do not modify the log uh, as expected. So this is a slight violation of the protocol. But uh, another violation of the protocol, which is even more important, is that, um, in fact, there are cases where there is no overflow here. For example, if you transfer money from your account to yourself, <laughs> then there shouldn't be any overflow. Yet this contract will report an overflow. Um, and reporting an overflow, um, not, it, 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 so it will detect an overflow. And detecting an overflow, it will not do the transaction, and the message will not be logged. And again, that can have implications of a different nature. So you um, would like to not violate the protocol, because if you do, then uh, others don't know what to expect from, from your code. So in, a, in other words, this uh, code actually does not uh, satisfy um, the ERC20 specification. This is not a problem. I specifically picked a piece of code which doesn't have uh, uh, very serious uh, um, uh, implications. But um, as we know, there were several attacks in the, in the Ethereum uh, uh, space uh, where uh, flaws in uh, smart contracts were exploited. And, um, and uh, lots of uh, money was uh, frozen or lost or stolen. Uh, one of the most recent examples um, happened only two months ago. The beauty coin example has a very similar um, uh, problem in the code. As you can see here, there is a multiplication between a counter and the value, that's the token, and how many tokens you have, what's the value. And then the amount is, as you expect, the number of tokens times the value. The problem is that this multiplication here is not protected. You can literally have an overflow there. Um, and uh, and, uh, and uh, that overflow can be um, catastrophic. Actually, it has been catastrophic. That, uh, um, um, allowed 
for a transaction to be initiated that um, there should be two transactions initiated that uh, violated um, that uh, the, the the correctness of uh, of, the, of, the, of the protocol, and uh, and uh, uh, I think there was a huge amount of tokens uh, stolen, which would be the order of 10 to the 70. Um, of course, they never got that money, but it literally destroyed the uh, the coin, more or less. And that's not the only attack. We know the DAO exploit, where uh, others stole uh, um, a less amount of money, and um, and um, and. Um, that this is one of the first uh, known attacks that led to a fork in the Ethereum uh, um, blockchain. And then we had uh, recently the parity bug attack, which um, uh, resulted in 280 million or so uh, being uh, being lost. And then uh, that was fixed. And then there was another attack also on the parity um, multi-sig. This time, uh, 300 million dollars were um, uh, stolen or frozen. So. Um, Right, so there are lots of problems like that, and there will be more problems uh, in, the, in, the, in the media. The question is, what can we do about this? Of course, there are lots of uh, political and economical factors that um, I cannot influence, but there are also technical factors out there. Actually, most of these errors were due to software bugs, problems in the code, in the smart contracts, that uh, could have been detected if the right uh, tools were, were used. Uh, so, I think we can do a lot about ensuring that the execution environment does um, um, uh, it behaves as, as expected. And in fact, I firmly believe that the ideal scenario is actually possible in, in, in this space. The ideal scenario is to basically use uh, formal methods to um, rigorously specify what um, basically everything <laughs> can rigorously formalize everything, the programming languages, the virtual machines, everything. And then the implementations themselves uh, can be provably correct and must be prov provably correct. And this is possible to do in this space. Specifically, I believe that we can have provably correct virtual machines uh, or interpreters that run in nodes. And I believe that uh, the smart contracts can use well-designed programming languages. And um, um, those programming languages come with provably correct compilers or interpreters. And finally, in terms of verification, I think that all the smart contracts that run on the blockchain could be provably correct with respect to their, to their specs. I believe that this is uh, possible. And now, whenever we see many languages uh, um, and we see lots of provably correct keywords around uh, makes us think that, um, that we may need a language framework, right? We have several languages going on here. We have uh, Solidity, we have uh, uh, or other high-level languages like Plutus, in which we write the actual smart contracts, and we have the lower-level languages in which, um, um, uh, which actually are interpreted by the virtual machines. So all these languages need to be formalized somehow in order to, to, to prove uh, properties about them. So a language framework is, um, is, um, uh, is, uh, would, would be very, very convenient in, in such, a, such a context. Now, we are firm believers in, 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 in this um, vision of an ideal language framework that has been proposed many years in the past. And, um, and, um, and um, many of us believe that it is possible to have an ideal language framework. Uh, there are technical limitations, but maybe it is time to address those technical limitations. So let me tell you what we mean by an ideal language framework. So the idea is to have one formal language definition for a given programming language. That means both syntax and semantics, to have just one definition. And then from that definition, to generate everything that we need for that language. Um, in a, so that, that those could be generated automatically or semi-automatically by the framework itself. And what I mean by that, I mean basically everything that you need for your language, like starting with parsers and interpreters, but then going further into compilers, debuggers, symbolic execution engines, model checkers, and even deductive uh, uh, program verifiers. We believe that all these can be generated from a formal um, definition of a programming language. 
What I'm going to tell you um, about the next few minutes is uh, how we are attacking this problem of an ideal language framework with uh, our um, effort, the K framework. I'm not saying that we have solved the problem because that's not yet uh, uh, solved, but I can uh, tell you how we are trying to solve the problem and how far uh, we went and, uh, and, um, um, and also some of our um, efforts in the, in the blockchain uh, uh, space. All right, so next I would like to say a few words about how we approach this, um, this challenge, uh, the challenge of an ideal language framework through our um, K uh, framework effort. I'm not saying that we have solved the problem because the problem is hard to solve and it will take many years, but I can uh, report on some of the, um, the results and uh, I can show you some uh, uses of the framework in the context of, uh, of blockchain languages and uh, where we use it actively for formal verification of smart contracts. <coughs> so first of all, how, how K was born? Um, We've been teaching programming languages for many years and we used various approaches, uh, various semantic styles like uh, big step, small step operational semantics, uh, denotational semantics, the chemical abstract machine, reduction semantics with evaluation context, uh, rewriting logic, uh, literally almost all approaches uh, that people have developed over the years um, um, to uh, give semantics to programming languages and we learned from each of the, of, the, of the semantic approaches, we tried to understand what is really nice, what works, and at the same time try to avoid the limitations. And um, in the end, we basically engineered the framework by grabbing from the different approaches what was useful and worked for us, and at the same time trying to stay away from um, uh, problems that we thought uh, stay in the way of defining uh, languages uh, easily at scale. And some of the major problems that we found with almost all the semantic approaches were with respect to scalability and basically with respect to modularity uh, and uh, reuse. Um, it is often the case that when you add a new feature to your language, you have to go back and change almost everything that you've done in order to accommodate a new feature to your language. And that uh, is quite inconvenient and demotivating to experiment and design new languages. So uh, the K framework was designed in the spirit of, uh, of, uh, of uh, basically avoiding that, lim that major limitation and, and, and to be modular and easy to use. Then once the framework stabilized, once we defined several languages using it, then um, the theory came. Um, we refrained from developing the theory prematurely. We thought that the framework is not ready for um, nailing down its foundations and uh, then we worked on the foundations after um, uh, we had several languages defined. And that was quite a wise decision because the framework changed a lot um, during, uh, during these efforts. And it is only now that um, we think it's, it's finally stable and, uh, and ready to disseminate uh, the foundations and the theory. <clears throat> Before I go into more um, um, high level aspects, I would like to show you, to give you a flavor of how K works. Obviously I cannot teach K here now um, in all the details, but I can give you a high level picture of, of uh, how you would write a definition in, in K. This is a very simple language, kernel C, a fragment of C, much, much, much simpler than the actual C. Um, and um, and uh, it's, um, it, so this is, this is the entire language. It's a complete definition. We call this the language poster. It is generated by one of the tools in the K uh, framework from the textual semantics of the language. On the left, we have the syntax and macros, and on the other two columns, we have, uh, we have the semantics. Um, and I'm going to zoom into important parts of the definition only. Syntax. So we define syntax using a regular BNF notation. However, we annotate the syntax with, um, uh, with uh, K-specific um, um, uh, comments, which are interpreted by, by the K uh, framework um, <coughs> in, 
in a semantic way. For example, here we say that our language has an expression, uh, has an assignment, which is an, uh, which is an expression construct uh, in C, not a statement. And it is sticked in the second argument, meaning that we have to evaluate the second argument before we can say anything else about the semantics. So before we can talk about the semantics of assignment, we have to first evaluate uh, the expression that we assign to the, to the variable. And we found by <laughs> actually defining languages that, that, that this is the best place to state your evaluation strategies uh, for your syntax when you define the actual syntax. Because you are there, when you define the syntax of your construct, you have in your mind the evaluation strategy. So it is uh, very convenient to just say it right away in an attribute uh, to, the, to the production. Um, and there are many other attributes. This is just one of them. So this is how you define syntax. These are macros uh, that the sugar complex constructs into simpler constructs. I'm not going to go into those. Um, the next step is to define the program configuration. All semantic approaches have some notion of a program configuration, which is a data structure holding everything that you need during the execution of the program. Or in other words, you can think about it like if I execute a program and you stop at a certain moment, so the configuration holds a snapshot of the program execution at that moment in time. That's where you have the remaining code that you have to execute. That's where you have the current uh, state of the program, the heap, the stacks, the registers, everything else that you need for your language. Um, and we got inspired from the chemical abstract machine um, um, approach where the semantic information, the configuration is holding these uh, semantic cells. Um, actually, they are called the solutions in the chemical abstract machine. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you have... Um, uh, the pieces of information that you hold in them are called molecules. So we decided to change the terminology. We call just we call all these semantic cells, and they hold semantic information. And uh, we also decided to label them. So this is, for example, there is a top-level configuration, as you can see. Then there is a K cell holding the code. There is the functions, the environment, memory, F function stack, input, output, buffers, and so on and so forth. So all these you have to define in the program configuration before you can um, talk about the semantics. However, um, as I said, K has been designed in the spirit of modularity, so you can add new semantic cells as you, as you um, progress, uh, as you advance your definition of your language. So if you decide to add exceptions later on, you can add another semantic cell for an exception stack, for example, if you want to do it that way, and then add rules, and you don't have to change any other uh, rules that, uh, that uh, you already defined for other features. And finally, the semantic rules, uh, which are the actual uh, um, <laughs> um, characteristic of, of K. So here we have the semantic rule for, for assignment, which um, says in words, uh, so this is the graphical representation, this is the textual representation, that's how you write it normally in the ASCII file, and this is what you generate from it. So um, <clears throat> what this is saying, let me, show it on the graphical representation, is that in order to give the semantics of assignment in your language, remember that assignment was taking the second argument, so this argument evaluated the ready to value. So in order to give semantics to assignment, then um, you need the K cell holding the code, in particular the assignment, and in the environment you must be able to match the variable X bound to uh, some value, the underscore, the anonymous variable, which we don't care about because we are going to change it anyway, so that's why we use an anonymous variable. And, um, and um, then we underline the things that change, so the assignment will change into V, and this uh, whatever value X was bound to um, will change to V. So this is saying that, first of all, X must be declared in order to assign something to it, because otherwise you cannot match it in the configuration, in the environment. And then you do two do writes at the same time, so it's like a transaction. So these two writes happen at the same time. And this is one of the novelties of K, which we call local rewriting. So as you can see in this rule, the textual rule, actually we have two arrows. There are two rewrite rules going on, one at the top of the K cell, and one in this uh, uh, delimited by this parenthesis. Uh, so in other words, we, what we do, we push the rewriting relation to the place down in the term, in the context where the writing, the changes take place as opposed to just having one big write at the top. This allows us to be more modular um, in the sense that, as you can see here, we can abstract away parts of the configuration that we do not care about. 
like the rest of the environment or the rest of the computation, because we do not have to repeat it in the left and the right hand side of the, of the term. <coughs> and metaphorically, these uh, uh, dot -dot dots, which we call structural frames, are represented on the, in the graphical notation as these tears on the cells. And the intuition is that, oh, I have a lot of information in that cell that I don't need, so I'm going to just tear it away and throw it away and only keep what you need. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the design principles of K from, the, uh, from early on was um, that we'd like to, we like the users to only have to write uh, in their semantics and rules what is absolutely needed and nothing else. Because every single character that you put in a rule that is not absolutely needed may work against you later on. When you extend the language, you have to come back and change it. Uh, so that's why we decided to minimize the amount of information that you have to convey in a semantic rule in order to capture the semantics of your language. Um, so as you can see here, there is really nothing which is uh, uh, unnecessary in the rule. So that's how K works. It's uh, very easy, actually. Uh, we teach it to uh, first year students um, at, um, at the uh, uh, University of Illinois, and there are several other um, professors who teach K at various other universities. And students grasp it relatively quickly, and, and then um, uh, they use it and they think of it as a language, of this weird programming language in which they implement other languages. But in fact, what they are doing is to define a formal semantics of a language. Um, it scales. Actually, that was one of the, uh, the important uh, uh, driving forces to define real languages, not only toy languages, because we had enough toy languages defined uh, uh, in the literature. So we defined languages like Java, JavaScript, uh, C. Um, and when I say that we define, I mean that we define them completely. Not 50%, not a convenient core, not even 95%, but li literally completely. Meaning that we're able to take um, benchmarks that uh, language developers use to test their implementations, compilers or interpreters, and we run exactly the same benchmarks with the K semantics of the language. One of the, the most major efforts so far was um, the C language. Uh, specifically, we took the standards manual of C, the ISO C11 standard, and formalized it completely um, in, the, in, the, in the K framework. And that was a big effort, took more than seven years in total. Um, and um, and um, there are more than 10,000 programs right now in the regression test suite. Each time we run, uh, we, each time we modify the semantics, we run all the tests to make sure that we do not break uh, any of them. Because the semantics of a language like anything big, especially for such languages, like anything big can have bugs. Uh, and the, the bugs in the semantics are even uh, uh, more serious than the bugs in the code because <laughs> they become part of the definition and, 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 and they will be accepted as features rather than, than, than bugs. So it is very important to properly validate um, and test your semantics in order to gain confidence that, uh, that uh, your semantics is appropriate for the language. <clears throat> and in addition to these uh, languages that, uh, that we defined early on in the K framework, now we define several other languages motivated by, um, by um, our verification efforts, formal verification efforts in the, in the blockchain space. Like uh, for EVM, Solidity, LA, Plutus, Viper, which I'm going to talk about later. Uh, so program configurations can be quite big. Uh, this is the configuration of C, only for you to have an idea how complex configurations can be. This has more than 120 cells, and one of them is the heap, uh, small up there, and more than 5,000 rules written by the user. So it was a big effort, and lots of bugs have been found, but in the end, it uh, works, uh, which is uh, quite uh, encouraging, because if it works for C, then uh, maybe it works for other languages too, for maybe for any other language if it works for C. So what I'm going to show you next is how we are approaching the various 
blue boxes on this picture, the various tools that uh, we want to generate automatically from, uh, from a formal semantics. So how we approach uh, this uh, big important problem in the K framework. And I'll first focus on the interpreter because the interpreter is one of the main tools. It's by far the most used tool in the, in the, in the tool suite. Why? Because each time you define a language, what you want is to test it. Right? You write a syntax of your language and then you immediately want to run some programs, uh, to, to parse some programs first. Then as soon as you add um, uh, some meaningful programs, you want to execute them to see do I get the right result. So you always test, you always test, and how you test using the interpreter capability. So this is how we do it in K currently. We have a translator from K to OCaml, and then we compile the resulting OCaml natively. All right, and this way we get an interpreter. So K to OCaml to binary, native binary. Um, and uh, uh, for C, we have incorporated this interpreter that is generated automatically from the C semantics into a product, a runtime verification, uh, uh, the startup that, uh, that, uh, that um, uh, um, I founded uh, in order to commercialize uh, all, the, all the research around the, the, the formal semantics of programming language that we develop in our lab at the university. So this tool, RVMatch, is essentially just <laughs> k-instantiated with the C semantics and executed with your camera interpreter currently. And this is how it works. So suppose that you have a C program, like this program here, which actually has a problem. I'm not going to tell you what the problem is. You, you can figure it out yourself. Um, so, but, but one of the typical problems with C programs is that you compile them and run them, and you see nothing. Uh, you, the, the, the compiler, and then when you run the binary, do not detect the, the problems because uh, uh, programs can have uh, this so-called undefined behavior, and when you have an undefined behavior, um, the compiler is allowed to do whatever it wants. In this case, the GCC compiler compiles the program, gets a binary, and then when you run the binary, nothing happens, meaning that, that, uh, that uh, with GCC you cannot detect actually this problem. However, if you compile the same program with the KCC tool, which is part of the RVMatch uh, tool, if you compile it with a KCC program, then you get a binary, same like with, when you compile it with GCC, but when you run that binary, you see all these uh, errors. Um, and this describes exactly what the problem is, and it also gives you pointers to uh, sections in the C standard where, where that uh, type of undefined behavior is explained in detail. And we did that because some early users of our system complained that our tool RVMatch reports false alarms which uh, is incorrect because the tool does not report any false alarm. Um, and because of that, we added pointers to the exact description of the undefined behaviors um, in, in the standard, and now the users can go and, and, and check them. In order to sell RVMatch, we had to compare it with uh, the existing uh, tools, the state of the art. And here uh, we were uh, lucky that Toyota made public a benchmark of, uh, of, uh, of uh, tricky programs that uh, they used to evaluate static analysis tools. And, um, and that benchmark was published two, three years ago. And, uh, and, and there, Toyota, the Toyota researchers evaluated several static analysis tools and they came up with some numbers and some metrics and in the end, they uh, calculated a so-called productivity metric, which is just one number that you can attach to each tool. Like to code Sonar, for example, they got the number 82, which was the highest number for all the tools that they evaluated. Um, the, the benchmark is public, so what we did, we took exactly the same benchmark and ran it with, uh, with KCC, the same uh, way I showed you um, with that example. And uh, we're very pleased to see that actually we scored uh, 91, um, and, uh, and that's particularly <laughs> uh, 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 encouraging because our tool was not crafted for C. Uh, it's just a generic interpreter, generic uh, um, uh, execution engine generated automatically from the formal semantics of C, which is public, open source, and everybody can, uh, can uh, wait in and say whether it's the right uh, C or not. So it is very nice to see a general purpose tool, language independent, that is just instantiated with a particular language, and then to see that that gives you better results 
than uh, tools that were specifically crafted for that language out there, and which are also very expensive. <clears throat> then we also compared it with many other tools that are free. Actually, all these tools here, they, uh, you, you have to purchase li licenses to use them. Um, and, but there are lots of other tools which are free, like the Valgrind uh, kind of tools, uh, and Hellgrind, the LLVM sanitizers. Frama C also has a program analysis tool, the CAMCERT interpreter. Um, also can uh, detect undefined behaviors. And um, um, actually, all these, other, all these free tools scored, the best of them was um, uh, the LLVM uh, sanitizer um, uh, uh, tools. And they together uh, scored uh, 67, so lower than, uh, than the commercial tools, which is not unexpected. Uh, but um, um, we just wanted to make sure that um, that uh, we compare also favorably with dynamic analysis tools, because many of these tools are dynamic analysis. Um, <clears throat> my point here really is that having a formal semantics can be worthwhile. Um, we, we may have reached a point where we can compete with actual tools that were specifically developed for, for um, specific languages. And, and, and this is, this is uh, amazing in my view, because f we got to a point where it is worth giving a formal semantics to a language. Formal semantics is not just an academic exercise anymore. It is useful. It is practical. It is the best way to, to, to get the best tool in the end. Um, the question now, once um, things worked for C, was uh, can we move on? Can we go to other languages and, and use the same infrastructure, the same ideas for other languages and see what we get? And we started um, looking into the blockchain uh, languages, as I mentioned, mainly because this is a place where correctness of programs has uh, a huge, huge importance. Uh, because most, as I said, most of the security attacks that I showed you are rooted into, into errors in, uh, in programs. I'll talk more about that. Uh, just wanted to wrap up the interpreter capability with uh, future uh, uses of it. All right, so, so far I told you about how you can generate an interpreter from uh, a K language definition. Next, I'm going to show you how um, we can uh, do program verification, because this is one of the most important and, 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 and actually what, uh, what started us to define formal semantics. Um, how we can verify programs. How can we do deductive verification of programs based on a formal semantics, moreover, based exactly on the same formal semantics that we use for execution and for interpretation. Before that, let me give you a high-level overview um, of the state of the art in program verification these days. So the, w the way we verify programs is to first formalize the programming language in an appropriate um, uh, setting where we can reason about programs. And uh, there are several approaches there, like uh, whole logic or uh, dynamic logic or separation logic. And then to use these formalizations um, in order to derive facts about, about programs. <coughs> this is great because it gives you um, a logical framework in which uh, you can rigorously derive properties about programs. The problem, however, with these approaches is that you literally have to redefine your programming language semantics in a different framework. So suppose that you already had an executable semantics that gives you a reference model that you can use to interpret uh, programs and to develop tools like Match, or like RV Match, and now you have to put that aside and re define your programming language for a different purpose, uh, for verification. And we do not want that, uh, because uh, that is at best uneconomical. It, you, you would spend a lot of uh, effort to do the same thing that you've already done, that you already have a formal semantics. Why define another one? Um, and and these, these rules, the, the, the way you, you formalize a language like, like a logic, are, of course, very language specific. Like, for example, I, I picked whole logic, but I could have picked uh, other approaches too. Uh, so in, in whole logic, because whole logic is the most, one of the most popular approaches, in whole logic, as you can see, this is a proof rule uh, stating the invariant uh, uh, property of, uh, of while loops. 
This is a proof rule for dealing with procedures, uh, specifically with uh, procedures which can be recursive. And, and as you can see, they are very specific to your language. They use syntax of your language as part of the rules. Um, so you, it's, it's like a design pattern telling you how it's a process that uh, telling you how to design a logic for your language uh, in order to do reasoning. That sounds very natural, and it is very natural. Uh, we still use it in teaching. I, I use it in, uh, in my programming language classes. It's just that when, when it gets to real languages, which you already have a formal semantic, this is very tedious, and it's hard to justify to yourself. Why should I define another semantics for my language when I already have one, only for a different purpose? <laughs> Why? Because I already have a semantics, and the semantics already tells me everything I need to know about the language. Why have another semantics? That's, that's a, that's a an unnecessary effort, so can we avoid it? And, um, um, and this is what we actually want. So what we want, also for deduction, uh, deductive verification, is to use directly the trusted semantics, the semantics that I tested, that I validated, that I spent years already to formalize. I want to use exactly that one to uh, do verification. In other words, what I would like to have I would, like I would still like to have a logic, a proof system that allows me to prove and derive properties, but I want that to be language independent. I want that proof system to work with any language by simply presenting that language as a set of axioms to a proof system, and to have only one way to derive properties about programs that works for all languages, for all programs in all languages. That's what I want, if possible. Um, and moreover, I also want that proof system to be sound and relatively complete for all languages. That, mean, that means that anything that, uh, that the proof system proves is sound, um, uh, holds for, for the actual um, um, uh, programs in the language, and also that everything that, uh, so that's the soundness part, and the completeness part says that any property that holds for, uh, for the program is also provable with the proof system. And relative completeness in particular is very hard to prove for real languages, and I'm not aware of, of, uh, of actual uh, formal proofs for real languages, but what we'd like here is to get that for free. Okay? That means that I want a language independent proof system that is sound and relatively complete and works with all languages at the same time. All I need is to formalize my language as a theory in this, uh, in this logic and then use the general machinery to reason about, about programs in that language. And uh, that's what we do. It took us many, many years to come up with a logic that now, looking at it retrospectively, looks ridiculously simple. And uh, I don't know if that's a positive or a negative, but I think it's a positive. It's really very easy now to explain, um, and, uh, and it is almost unbelievable that, that uh, it can explain everything, everything that, that we do uh, with, 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 with the K, with the K um, uh, tools. In other words, everything that any of the tools of the K framework does can be seen as proof search in this logic that I'm going to tell you next. And uh, the logic is, as I said, very simple. It captures the essence of, of, uh, of, um, of um, uh, what you need in order to specify programming languages as well as properties about programs in programming languages. So one thing that you need, nevertheless, is uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to go through the, there are five major constructs. I'm going to go through these five major constructs, and, and they are grouped in three categories. There are structural, uh, there are structural constructs that allow you to, to build terms, basically. As you can see, you just have variables and then uh, symbols on top of, uh, of, of other terms. Um, but we do not call them terms, because you'll see they are more than terms. We call them patterns. <coughs> um, so, we build these uh, patterns uh, starting with variables and symbols on top of other patterns. And then you have um, constraints. There's another category of, of, symbol, of, 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 of constructs in the logic for constraints. 
you can negate a term, you can complement a pattern, take the intersection of two patterns, and this way you can do logical reasoning. So what does it mean to negate a pattern, actually? So as you see, the, the, the semantics, the meaning of patterns is that of pattern matching. So a pattern can be matched by many concrete instances. Like a pattern, for example, can express some kind of configuration where you may have this program in the, in the, in the computation, you may have these values in the heap, these values in the stack, and some constraints uh, over them. So this pattern specifies a set of possible states that match it. And then when you say not of a pattern, you mean the complement of that. Right? So that means that you do not match this pattern. And intersection of two patterns means that you match both, uh, both patterns. And finally, one other important construct in many languages that we define in K, specifically uh, functional languages, is, um, is binders. You need to bind variables that occur in a pattern, free, that occur free in a pattern, you need to bind them to a particular place where you declare that variable. And we could have chosen many different um, uh, binders, but we decided to go with existential um, um, uh, binder. So, uh, yeah, and that's, that's basically it, right? So structure, so we have uh, constructs for structure, for constraints, and for, for binders. And notice that there is no distinction between uh, symbols. Our symbols are just symbols. We, we do not categorize them as uh, function symbols or predicate symbols. Uh, we can axiomatize them to be uh, functional symbols or predicate symbols, but at this level, they are just symbols. We regard all symbols as, 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 as constructors of patterns. Right? So it's very simple, as you can see. <clears throat> then uh, symbols. In first order logic, symbols are interpreted as functions. Operational symbols are functions and predicate symbols as predicates. In matching logic, symbols are interpreted as relations or uh, equivalently as functions from the, the, the carriers of, uh, of the arguments to the power set of the result. And the intuition here is that a pattern can be matched by many different values, not only one. And we think of this matching also as satisfaction relation, right? So pattern is satisfied by all the values that match it. <coughs> and this allows us to interpret patterns as, as sets. And, uh, and as I said before, uh, complement, uh, negation as complement, uh, and as intersection, and the existential as union over all all values. I know it sounds very simple, but it took a lot of time to compress. Though we had much more complex versions of matching logic that eventually they had to be narrowed down and, and simplified, and we had to throw away things that we realized that were not needed or definable in the smaller core. And in the end, we, we, we came up with, with this uh, uh, very, very simple, actually, logic. There is also a proof system, and I do not have time to go into the details of the proof system. All you need to know, uh, and, and I can send you the paper if you, if you are interested in, all you need to know is that matching logic with that notion of satisfaction and models uh, is sound and complete, and the proof system that makes it complete has 13 proof rules, and that it includes completely first order logic. So we took the, the, the proof rules of first order logic as R, and they happen to be sound. Uh, we didn't expect them, all of them to be sound, uh, but they are all sound the way they are meaning that they were actually more general than, uh, than, uh, than uh, maybe uh, the creators of photo logic uh, thought initially. Then we have a, a set of rules uh, related to propagation of, uh, of uh, logical constraints. Right? Since we have symbols, and symbols can be applied to any patterns, and those patterns can contain inside uh, logical connectives, then a natural question is how do these logical connectives um, interact with the symbol above them. And it turns out that you cannot eliminate the logical, you cannot lift the logical connector always, but in some cases you do, like for uh, disjunction, for example, or for existential quantifier. And this is very useful for case analysis, for example. Another important proof rule is the framing rule, which allows us to do local reasoning. So if you're in a big context, imagine a program configuration, and in the heap, you want to say that you have a list, a linked list. 
right? You can go there and prove some properties about it. You can prove that this is implying, so the, the, this, you know, a, a portion of the heap implies a linked list. Then you can lift this local reasoning to the whole configuration through uh, the framing rule. You see, so I, here I prove uh, an implication, and then I can lift that implication to the entire uh, configuration. This is the context applied to, to the two terms. And then there are two other <laughs> unexpected rules that, um, that had to be added, mainly for technical reasons, to be able to prove the completeness theorem. And the existence rule is the, the, <laughs> the one that you wouldn't expect. <laughs> Um, exists x, x. Right? So this doesn't make any sense in first order logic, but it makes all the sense uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, matching logic. And when you translate it into models, that is basically saying that the universe of values is equal to the union of all these elements, <laughs> which is obvious um, semantically, but you cannot prove it with the other proof rules. So that was necessary. All right, so yeah, so these 13 proof rules make, uh, make um, matching logic sound and complete. And, uh, and um, um, that means that you can prove any properties about any theory in matching logic. Uh, the question is, is matching logic expressive enough to represent uh, everything? And again, this was inspired from our um, definitions of uh, various programming languages across various paradigms. Uh, some of them functional, other logical, other object-oriented. So uh, we knew that K works with all these paradigms. So we didn't know whether uh, everything makes full sense from a logical point of view. And, 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 and now I'm happy to, 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 to say that actually matching logic can explain, finally, um, everything going on under the hood in the K framework. And in terms of expressiveness, so we were able to define using matching logic um, various other logics that are out there and extremely useful for, uh, for, uh, for uh, programming languages or programming language uh, uh, formal analysis, such as first order logic. Um, you can define equality membership, partial functions. Notice that in conventional first order logic, you cannot define equality. Uh, you can uh, add as many axioms as you want, but you cannot make those axioms enforce equality to be interpreted as equality in, in models. It will be interpreted as some sort of uh, equivalence relation, but not as equality. Also, you cannot define partial functions. There is a whole area with books written about it uh, called partial first order logic. So here, we can define partial functions just fine um, using, uh, using uh, the matching logic uh, patterns. More interestingly, and initially unexpectedly, we can also capture um, um, calculi like lambda calculus and mu calculus, and uh, the trick, the trick to capture these general binders like in lambda or mu, is to realize that uh, a lambda binder in fact achieves two goals uh, at once. One is to build a term, and the other one is to build a binding. So what we do here is to separate the two, right? So we use a an auxiliary symbol, which here I denoted by lambda zero. Lambda zero that just builds the term, and then we use the existential quantifier that we already have to build the binding. And then we just say lambda xe is an alias for this. All right? So lambda xe puts together, bundles together <laughs> the term building capability and the binding capability. And that's very nice, because now you can think atomically about it. But in matching logic, we decompose into the two basic operations, and that allows us to now define lambda calculus as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an ordinary theory, literally, ordinary theory in, in matching logic, where you simply add this equation, which is the beta, beta equation, or if you want eta and other, other equations, you just add them there, they all make, uh, make full sense, where lambda is now just an alias for that. And you can do the same for mu and other types of, type, type of binders, uh, mu, here we say that, that, uh, that uh, mu is a fixed point. Um, <clears throat> and this doesn't state that mu is the least fixed point, but you can actually capture that property with another pattern, uh, which we call the knaster tarski pattern, which literally captures the essence of the knaster tarski theorem, right? which says that if psi is a fixed point of E, then mu is smaller 
than, uh, than it. And now once you add this proof rule as well, you have mu, you have fixed points. And with fixed points, you can define lots of uh, uh, other, other important logics. Like um, we went um, uh, ahead and again, I can, I can make the paper available, I cannot go through now. But you can define model logics, hor logics, dynamic logics, all of LTL, CTL, CTL star. You can define all those once you have a dynamic uh, logic that's well known. Separation logic as well, which is um, also just a machine logic theory. And finally, and more importantly for the connection uh, with K, re reachability logic. Right, so yeah, so we, we have recently realized that reachability logic, which was used as a foundation of K until recently, we realize that reachability logic itself can be defined actually in, in matching logic, which made matching logic the, the solid foundation of, of, of K. We just need one logic now which, uh, which does the entire story and it is so simple. Um, so next, let me tell you a few words about reachability logic because I'm pretty sure that will look like a lot more intuitive and useful to you than matching logic. But keep in the back of your mind, the reachability logic is again definable completely in matching logic. It's just a theory in matching logic like any other theories that I showed you before. So in reachability logic, what you do, you use patterns like this. Uh, you use um, actually rewrites between patterns, right? Remember in K we had a rewrite relation. This is the counterpart in reachability logic where you go from one pattern to another. And the intuition here is that if you give me a program configuration that matches phi, I will execute it with the programming language semantics and eventually reach, um, um, that's why it's called reachability logic, I'll eventually reach a configuration that matches phi prime. And this can generalize to conditional rules and it can also incorporate uh, side conditions nicely. Right, in term writing, when you have side conditions, say left to right to write if some side condition, but now we can conjunct the side condition with L and this is not even a conditional rule anymore in, uh, in reachability logic. And then we realize that actually the reachability um, relation can be stated as a pattern once we have uh, weak eventually, and weak eventually can be defined using mu. So reachability rules are just ordinary matching logic patterns. But from here on, I'm going to continue to present things with reachability rules because, as I said, they are more intuitive. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, actually, even in, in, in proofs, we, we use reachability um, as, as synthetic sugar for, um, for uh, patterns that you can define anyway using matching logic. <clears throat> Why reachability logic was the right formalism for us to explain what K does is mainly because the sentence of reachability logic, this reachability rule, um, captures at the same time both the elements of operational semantics that we use to define languages and of axiomatic semantics that we use to specify properties. Uh, specifically, we can take um, operational rules, transitions, and interpret, regard them as reachability in one step. This is, for example, the assignment, a small step semantics, operational semantics of assignment. As you can see, you go from this configuration to this configuration. These are just patterns. They have variables and so on. And I think now the intuition is quite clear why it is matching logic, right? Because you write this pattern and clearly this is being matched by the configurations that you wanted to capture when you wrote this, right? And then you say this rewrites writes to a configuration that matches this. Uh, but similarly, you can capture whole triples which uh, are specifications, basically, of programs where you have precondition, code, postcondition. And such specifications can be as well described as, uh, as reachability rules, where you have to create a little configuration, you have to add a precondition there, a condition, and then this reaches another configuration. So hot triples, just a particular instance of reachability rules, small step um, uh, transitions, a particular instance of reachability rules. So now we have a logic in which I can express both the operational semantics and the axiomatic semantics with the same uh, statements, reachability rules. And what is K? Now it's very easy to say what K is. K is literally a best effort implementation of reachability logic. Um, K is doing its best with heuristics, with algorithms, decision procedures, whatever it can, to implement uh, reasoning in reachability logic. So this is how it works. Um, like any other program verification environment, it takes as input uh, a program and a specification or specification that you want to verify. But what is different here 
in our in the program in the K program verifier is that the verification infrastructure is one box that you do not touch. That's one for all the languages. And then that takes as input the particular programming language, right, in which uh, you want to write your program. Right? So in other words, we instantiate the program verifier with the language semantics and then um, and then uh, um, the verification infrastructure reduces the problem of verifying those specifications to, uh, to smaller problems that can be solved in the, in the mathematical domains um, of the various uh, um, um, built-ins that, uh, that, uh, that we use, like uh, natural numbers or booleans and so on, which then we discharge with SMT solvers like, uh, like Z3. So in some sense, you can think of the K-verification infrastructure as a little engine that takes the language semantics as input, and then it allows you to reduce the problem of verifying a program for that particular, log uh, particular programming language to queries to an oracle that knows about uh, all the mathematical domains uh, that you need in order to specify properties or uh, the semantics of your programming language. This is where the relative completeness actually comes into the picture in our, in our framework. So um, this is complete, uh, relat or machine logic is uh, complete, relative to um, a model or an oracle for, uh, for certain uh, domains that uh, we consider fixed. And now what we do in the blockchain space, we instantiate the verification infrastructure with more languages, like the EVM, YELE, Bluetooth, Solidity, and so on and so forth. We have evaluated the, the, the K program verifier with several large languages, C, Java, JavaScript, and uh, the morale overall is that Performance is not an issue. So um, uh, we have been uh, <laughs> discussing with many colleagues and, and, and they said, yeah, even if you make this work, the performance is going to be horrible. You will you'll not be able to do anything efficiently. And we have actually written a paper specifically to compare performance. And there are lots of numbers there two years ago in Uppsala. Um, but in the end, the, the conclusion is that uh, performance is not a big issue. We compared for C how long it takes to verify um, a program uh, in C using our approach versus, versus the same program in C using a VCC, the VCC prover, which is a, one of the most influential uh, um, provers for, for C, <coughs> uh, which was extended with separation logic by, by a research group. And in the end, we verified the program in 280 seconds, while the, uh, the other, um, the VCC tool verified in 200. 60 seconds, yes, a bit faster, but <laughs> not, not, a, not a big difference. Um, so anyway, the, the, my, my point is that a, a language-dependent verification infrastructure can be, in the end, as efficient as, as, uh, as um, other specialized uh, verifiers for specific languages can be. Because in the end, most of the time will be spent to solve queries to the, to the SMT solver, which uh, will be pretty much the same, no matter uh, what prover uh, you use in the end. All right, so now let me tell you um, how we use all this key infrastructure that uh, I presented for the blockchain. <clears throat> the very first step to approach smart contracts formally is to have a formal semantics of the basic machinery, basic virtual machine that runs smart contracts, which is the Ethereum virtual machine. For that, we have defined the, the, the K um, EVM sem semantics, which is a formal semantics in K of the EVM. Um, and uh, like with all the other languages, we have given a complete semantics um, and we thoroughly tested it. Uh, we tested it against more than 40,000 programs that come with, uh, with the Ethereum uh, C++ implementation and we passed all of them. That was not unexpected that we passed them because we've done that with many other benchmarks before, but what was slightly unexpected and kindly a um, uh, surprise was that the performance of interpretation was not as bad as I th initially thought. I thought it would be at least 100 times slower than the actual C++ implementation, but it turned out that it was only 20 times uh, slower. And there are a few programs, 10 or 15 programs uh, among the 40,000, which were the stress tests, which took most of the, of the uh, which are responsible for most of the overhead. When you take those out, you get 10 times actually only uh, um, uh, um, 
slower uh, execution with the interpreter generated uh, from the K framework. And this may look bad if, uh, you know, at, at first sight, but in fact, think about it. Think what happens here. You are executing an actual formal specification of the EVM, and that's only 10 times slower. So <laughs> you, you didn't implement anything. You just execute the mathematical model of the EVM, the specification of the EVM. Um, and some, the specification is what you would like to prove about the, the C++ implementation, if you can, but that would be very hard. So you just execute that, and, uh, and it's only 10 times slower. So we thought that that's, that's excellent news uh, that gave us uh, energy and enthusiasm to think that we may be able, in the end, to generate interpreters that can be practical. Uh, maybe at a point that where they can even compete with, ha with uh, handwritten interpreters for, for languages. <clears throat> and in fact, this is one of the things that, uh, that we are doing right now with the EVM together with uh, IOHK. Um, we actually um, are going to, we, we have generated and deployed a correct by construction EVM client. We have a KEVM testnet that uh, runs the KEVM interpreter, or the interpreter generated by the K framework from the EVM semantics in K. Um, and uh, if you search on the internet, IOHK, EVM client, and so on, testnet, you will, uh, you will uh, find the links. And uh, you follow them, and you can actually go ahead and run your smart contracts with, uh, with, K, with a KEVM uh, client, which, uh, which is great. Uh, but you can do more than that. You can also verify smart contracts, right? You can now using the, the reachability logic and matching logic verification approach, now you can take smart contracts and use the KVM semantics and verify them, prove that they do what they are supposed to do. And this is actually one of the thrusts uh, in my startup, the runtime verification. We verify smart contracts commercially, and the way we do it is to take the K verification infrastructure, instantiate it with, uh, with the the case semantics of EVM, and then uh, verify smart contracts. Basically, use the, the proof system of matching logic and, and prove that contracts do what, uh, what is claimed. <coughs> as, uh, as part of, uh, of our effort to verify smart contracts, uh, we also engage with the Ethereum Foundation to verify uh, one of their main protocols, Casper. There are some changes uh, planned for Casper, but uh, for the time being, we are the team in charge of verifying the, the Casper uh, protocol, which is implemented as a smart contract, which needs to be verified just like any other smart contract. It's, just, it's a lot more complex than uh, the usual smart contracts. So the point is that this formal semantics of EVM can be used not only to generate an EVM client that you can then use to <laughs> run smart contracts, but also Exactly the same uh, specifications can be used to generate a program verifier that verifies smart contracts. You see no other semantics of the EVM for verification needs. It's exactly the same semantics, both for execution and for verification. <clears throat> Another important effort, and probably one of the most important <laughs> achievements of the K framework recently, is um, a new EVM-like language uh, for the blockchain, Yele, which we designed from scratch using K, and we generate the implementation completely automatically, the same way we generated one for, uh, for uh, EVM. And um, what we did was to retrospectively analyze the EVM specification that we defined, and to look at all the attempts that we had to verify smart contracts and to try to understand where things were harder than expected, and then step back and think how should have a virtual machine for executing smart contracts being designed in order to overcome all those problems. Um, and we came up with Yele. This is the best we could come up with, and in short, Yele is an LLVM-like virtual machine for the blockchain. Right? That's the simplest way to, to think about it. Um, and for me, as 
a designer of, of K and the creator of the K framework, this is a hugely important milestone um, because it is for the first time when a real language has been defined in K and its implementation has been automatically generated and that's the implementation of the language. There will be no other implementation, uh, ad hoc, handcrafted implementation. This is the LLVM, the actual um, uh, um, interpreter generated uh, by the K framework from the semantics. Uh, so previously, all the real languages that have gone through this process were either existing languages like C, Java, JavaScript, or toy languages. So this is the first time when a real language is designed that way from scratch and the implementation automatically generated from, from it. And again, if you're interested, you can search for Yele, um, uh, uh, blog posts, IOHK, and you'll, uh, you'll, uh, you'll uh, find several pages and soon more uh, pages describing Yele. There is also GitHub repository. Everything I present here is open source and public, so feel free to, to uh, download and contribute and, and, and play with, with, with this. IOHK, uh, in collaboration with uh, Runtime Verification, are going to launch um, a testnet running Yele this time. So it's the same infrastructure, the same network infrastructure, uh, Mantis, that is being used also to run uh, the KVM client, but this time it will run the Yele um, um, uh, VM under the hood. And this way, for the first time, <laughs> literally for the first time, people can execute smart contracts using a different VM than the Ethereum virtual machine. And uh, we encourage you to try it and let us know um, what you think. Please feel free to report bugs, uh, performance bugs. Um, yeah, we're interested in bad things. We don't need to, you to tell us good things. We know the good things tell us the bad things that you find about uh, uh, the Yale testnet. And uh, <laughs> the reason I, I have this, this slide here is to also show you that Yale is, is quite human readable. Uh, you may not see the, the fonts because they are small, but you can see that you have a contract here and you have a function and another function and this code is human readable. It's same like LLVM. LLVM was designed also to be human readable and we really like that. So we borrowed from the LLVM everything that, uh, that we could because we like LLVM. <laughs> and, 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 and Yale matches that and adapts it for the blockchain. Several other languages in the blockchain space have been given uh, or are being given semantics uh, in K as we speak, such as the WebAssembly. The Ethereum Foundation also is shifting towards WebAssembly uh, from the EVM. Everybody recognizes that EVM has some problems and uh, there are better alternatives. Uh, we go with Yale, the Ethereum Foundation goes with Wasm, but what's interesting to notice is that Wasm is also formalized, being formalized in K. Um, as well. And um, Solidity is another language. Uh, Plutus is, uh, Solidity is actually the main language used for smart contracts in the, in the um, smart contract <laughs> community. But there are many other languages that, um, that are being proposed in order to address um, problems discovered uh, over the years with, uh, with Solidity. And one of, the one of these languages is called Plutus. Um, also uh, designed by uh, IOHK, um, um, and um, they, they work very closely with uh, Philip Wadler, who's leading the, the, the Plutus effort, um, and, and, and we are formalizing Plutus also in, uh, in, uh, in K with the final goal of, of being able to, uh, to prove Plutus uh, or smart contracts in Plutus also correct, and also to be able to uh, to translate those programs to Yele and ultimately run everything using the Yele, the Yele VM. And Viper is another language proposed by, uh, by the Ethereum Foundation, uh, which is a moving target. Actually, Plutus is also a moving target, but in the case of Viper, the formal specification and, and uh, implementation go hand in hand. And, uh, and um, so the formal specification of Viper literally helps the design of the language, but the design is still done in the traditional way, um, but in parallel with it, we also do the formal specification. So, so far I talked about what ha we have done so far with, with K. Now, what I'm going to talk about um, next for the 
the rest of the presentation, 10 minutes, is ongoing projects in the K-Framework. Um, things that we'd like, new tools and new infrastructure that we'd like to add to the K-Framework in order to, um, to provide better support for, um, for, um, for uh, users and for uh, um, uh, the languages that are being defined uh, in K. And uh, by the way, we are re-implementing actually the entire K-Framework in Haskell and we are hiring, so if interested, uh, um, please contact me. All right, so um, remember that uh, the interpreter is one of the most important tools and that the current OCaml backend of K is fast enough to power KVM, the KVM testnet, to power the Yale testnet, um, and actually the tool RV match that is being commercialized by, uh, by uh, runtime verification. However, we think we can do a lot better. We can have a faster backend. Um, and, and the trick is to understand the specific needs of K matching and then to generate a pattern matcher that goes beyond your camel pattern matcher, go directly to LLVM and make it very specialized to, 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 to the K framework. Because sometimes we have thousands of rules, actually in the case of C, there are like 25,000 different rules. So you have an OCaml match statement with 25,000 cases. As you can imagine, there's a performance uh, penalty there to pay. So we believe that uh, by very case specific, uh, using very, uh, we can implement a very case specific matcher directly in LLVM. Uh, so that's what you're working on now. And we believe that once that is implemented, we can get uh, at least an order of magnitude performance um, uh, in uh, um, uh, improvement uh, on performance. And when that happens, if uh, my prediction is, is right, then we'll get to a point where we can compete with actual handcrafted interpreters. All right? So if you are a designer of a language, you may be motivated to implement your language as a, as a, as a mathematical theory in K, and then generate an interpreter which would be as fast, maybe faster actually, than the interpreter that you write by hand. Um, but it's, that's not the only benefit you get. You also get all the program verification infrastructure and, uh, and all the other uh, uh, tools in the K ecosystem. But even in terms of execution, we believe that we get to a point where <coughs> you can be more motivated to write a, a formal semantics than to implement an interpreter for your language. Another um, important <coughs> uh, piece of research and, uh, and, and, and tool that we are developing for the K-Framework is what we call semantics-based compilation, which means to go beyond interpretation um, to compile, to generate a compiler from a semantics. And the way to do that is to use symbolic execution and try to summarize all the behaviors of your program that can be summarized statically, <laughs> statically, right, before execution. And then at runtime, only pay the cost for whatever cannot be determined statically. Um, <clears throat> this is a high level picture describing uh, the idea. So the idea is to have a, a, a new tool in the framework, semantics based in SBC, let's call it SBC which would take a language as input and a program in that language, right? And then it would generate another language definition, let's call it LT, which is a specialization of L for the program P. In other words, you have like a new semantics of a new programming language or of a new language, but that language is actually hardwired for your original program P. It doesn't know anything else except your original program um, and uh, and uh, the advantage of that is that that semantics will be a lot simpler and all the computation that you do it over and over and over again when you interpret your program will be gone and done, it, done only once statically. We did some experiments. We took a simple language with while loops, assignments, and so on. This looks like, like C. It's actually just like the kernel C. And uh, applying SBC, we get this specification, we draw it as an automata, automaton, because it is an automaton, 
but in fact, all this is encoded with the right rules. So this is like a new programming language having one, two, three, four instructions, and these rules, these arrows are actually rules. This is how the, the green color says how they change the state, the red color um, says what side conditions we need to check. And in the end, this is really very easy to execute um, efficiently. Um, it, it, it essentially uh, refers to particular important points in the program, like the beginning of the loops. And then uh, it summarizes entirely the basic blocks, even the conditionals. Um, uh, so basically everything that you can do statically, you do statically. And then you generate a definition, a new definition, which now you can compile and run with whatever backend you want. And in experiments, we've seen uh, performance speedups of at least an order of magnitude, sometimes more. So by doing SBC and then using the LLVM backend, we hope that we can get to a point where the compiler generated from a semantics, not only that they are correct by construction, but they will also be close, uh, at least for some languages, to actual handcrafted uh, uh, compilers uh, for the language. Probably it will be hard to beat GCC or Clang um, soon, <laughs> but uh, at least um, for, for languages that are not very, very well engineered or domain-specific languages, this can give the best possible way to, uh, to um, implement a compiler for a language. All right, the final um, <coughs> project that uh, we are working on is um, to generate proof objects for everything that K does. As I told you, every single tool, everything, every single uh, blue box here, in the end what it does, it searches for a proof. Um, um, there are decision procedures, efficient algorithms, but in the end you can think of what it does as searching for a proof. Um, and uh, if that is the case, then why not generate a proof, a proof object out of it? And then if you do that, you can use that proof object to serve as a correctness certificate for what the tool did, right? So for example, now, suppose that we use the K tool, or you use the K verifier to verify a smart contract. Why should you trust it? Uh, if you trust your verification, it means that you trust K, which is something very big to trust. K is huge, and it can have bugs like anything else. Uh, so how about generating an actual proof object, and then uh, using that as a correctness certificate, and that's the only thing you have to trust. You don't have to trust K. So that's what we plan to do. And even for the parser, uh, we want to also, um, to also generate uh, proof objects. Because we found that sometimes the parser parses the program in an unexpected way. We had the program x minus 1, and to our surprise, it was parsed as the function x applied to the argument minus 1, <laughs> completely crazily. So if you prove something about that program, you prove something about the wrong program. So parsing itself actually can generate proof objects to, uh, to, to, to say that, uh, that uh, the parsing was done correctly. And uh, that's what we intend to do. <clears throat> and I would like to conclude with our grand vision for how K can serve as a universal language for the blockchain. You've seen lots of tools, lots of applications. Um, <laughs> what we'd like to do is actually to we realize that we can put all this together and, and, and be able to provide an infrastructure where People can write smart contracts in any programming languages they want for which they have um, a case semantics. And this is how we envision that. This may be completely off, this may never work, but I think it's worth a, th a thought at least. So let's get back to our blockchain uh, um, um, uh, picture. And what we'd like to do is to actually store in certain accounts formal semantics of languages, right? Like for example, here I'm going to store the solidity, the, the case semantics of solidity version 0.2.1. From case perspective, version 21 and version 22 are completely different languages, right? And in fact, if you claim that you verify a program in solidity, you have to see the exact version of solidity because <laughs> the program can have completely different behaviors, right? So once we freeze the, the version of the language, why not also freeze it forever <laughs> by putting it in the, in the blockchain? All right, and then you can have many other languages the same way. So the case semantics of languages will be stored in the blockchain. And now, whenever you want to write um, uh, a contract, let's say like in this uh, new block, this new transaction, then 
You can write that contract in any language for which you have a semantics in the blockchain. Right? Just refer to that language but by its unique uh, ID, let's say L in this case, a unique address of the language, where the language is, and then use the, the SBC tool for that language. And there is no doubt about which language you are talking about because there is a unique, unique way to identify it. So use SBC for that language. You may optionally also verify the program P using the semantics of L. But keep in mind that whatever you verify, verify there may be irrelevant because the compiler can change the meaning of the program. So that's not really necessary because we verify things directly at the, at the binary level. Then, once we have um, LP, the SBC P, according to the semantics of L, then we can use the YELE backend of K to generate a YELE program P L, yes, say, corresponding to your program P, right? So all this translation from program P in language L now became uh, a program in Yale. And now we can formally verify that program, the smart contract, at the Yale level, right? That's the, the, the bottom. You don't have to trust the, anything. You don't have to trust, uh, maybe even SBC may have errors. You don't have to, even have to trust SBC. You go all the way down to, to Yale. So you see, this way you only put contracts that have been verified on the, on the blockchain. And you have uh, um, also the language semantics on the blockchain, which is a good place actually to store them anyway. Then the nodes, right? The nodes can themselves run a Yale client, a Yale VM. And Yale has been generated, a Yale client that has been generated automatically from the formal semantics of Yale. All right, so you can imagine that all these nodes run Yale and, uh, and uh, and this way, if you step back and look at the whole picture, in the end, everything being executed on the blockchain or everything on the blockchain, it's either a formal specification or something that has been generated automatically, correct by construction, from a formal specification. And all the smart contracts in various languages have been verified in the end. Right? So there are, there are no places where human error can, uh, can, uh, can uh, uh, interfere with, uh, with the whole process. Of course, there is still the question of whether we get the specifications right, and that will always be a question. But I would rather have that problem than low-level problems in, in the code that I cannot uh, control. In conclusion, we believe that this can be done. The ideal language framework can be approached these days, whether K is the final answer, I don't know, probably not. But at least I believe that uh, it uh, demonstrated that um, it is worth pursuing this path. And if this works, then why should you do things any other way? Because we shouldn't if this works. Thank you.